Hey everyone, my name is Wedge. Not only is Dragons of Tarkir out, but the Pro Tour has come and gone, and we're already seeing the effects it's having on Standard. So we thought we'd put together a deck tech for one of the decks that's been showing solid results in post-Dragon Standard. For this deck tech, we're doing something a little different. We'll actually be looking at the deck that our very own Armstrong ran at game day over the weekend. The deck was heavily based on Andrew Nachi's Team Aggro deck from the SCG Open in Syracuse earlier this month, with some slight alterations to taste. As per tradition, we'll step through the deck and then talk about matchups and sideboarding. Let's start with the lands. There are 24 and they balance fast mana that can come in untapped, usually at a price, with some tapped lands with extra benefits. We bias slightly towards the fast sources because the deck has a relatively lean mana curve and needs to come out swinging to really be effective. There's four wooded foothills with three mountains and three forests to search for with them. A mana confluence, two shivan reef, and two yavimaya coast provide fast colored mana at a tolerable life cost. It helps that the reefs and coasts can tap for free colorless mana. The other nine lands come in tap but give us some benefits to mitigate the drawback. We have five temples, three temple of abandon, one epiphany, and one mystery. The scry helps keep your draws consistent. The other four are frontier bivouac because we have enough of a need for blue sources that it's worth it to have painless options. Also tapping for green and red is critical because of the number of double green and double red costs in the deck. The creature curve is the focal point of the deck. We start at one mana with a playset of Elvish Mystic. Being able to ramp up quickly can take a decent draw and make it truly explosive. In the two slot, we've got seven creatures in total. Four of them are Heir of the Wilds. The Death Touch poses a significant threat to bigger, tougher creatures like Sea Drino and Corsair of Crufix that could ordinarily block a bear without a second thought. Plus, you'll be able to activate its ferocious trigger and swing as a 3-3 most of the time. The other three two drops are Frost Walkers. Sure, it's targeting equals death trigger isn't great, but it's hard to argue with four power for two mana. Three mana is where things start getting spicy. There's a place at a Goblin Rabble Master on the list because, as is well documented, if left unchecked, the Rabble Master and his crew get out of hand fast. Our other place at at three is Savage Knuckle Blade. This has been a favorite card of ours, mainly of Armstrong, since cons came out. If you hit some ramp in the right lands, he can come down on turn 2 or come out swinging on turn 4. Late in the game, he can bash in as a 6-6 six, six and dodge removal, the latter of which is especially strong against the control and mid-range decks in standard right now. Our last 3 drop is Boon Seder, a 3 of. First things first, he's another ferocious enabler for only 3 mana, which is useful for us. You can also bestow him onto an unblocked attacker for a permanent 4 power boost out of nowhere. His flash also serves well if you're keeping mana open for Lightning Striker or Savage Knuckle Blade activations. 4 mana is basically the top of our curve, though we do technically have a couple 5 drops. Ash Cloud Phoenix is a 1 of. It's solid against Sweeper since it never goes away permanently once it's on the board, and it does some extra damage when it turns face up. However, that doesn't come up too often, and frankly, we can do better for 4 mana. Case in point, Sorak the Huncaller. We're only running two because his being legendary makes him less good if drawn in multiples, but his ability to make anything hasty can give you huge combats as early as turn three. If nothing else, he can give himself haste with almost perfect consistency. Our last four drop is Thunderbreak Region as a three of. A 4-4 flyer for four is already strong, but its ability is what puts it over the top. Anytime an opponent targets it, they take three damage. So much for all that removal, and its effect applies not just to itself, but to all of your dragons. That means that if you get multiple out, they stack. Six damage to take out one dragon, to have fun with that. We finish out our pack of creatures with two five drops. Ordinarily, these should both be Stormbreath dragons. However, we swapped out one of them for a Sark and the Dragon Speaker. On the surface, they're fairly similar. Four four flying hasty dragons for three red red that resist removal in some way. Sarkin has the added benefit of being able to shoot down anything that dies to 4 damage. Stormbreath Dragon can hit blue control players hard if it sticks around for a couple turns though, which also comes in handy sometimes. We played around with one of each just to see whether there was one we preferred, and we found that a lot of the time they're pretty interchangeable. The remaining 6 spots in our deck go to burn spells. Lightning Strike is simple, efficient, and an instant, which is more than a lot of burn spells in standard can say. We run 2 saving our other four slots for Crater's Claws. 
While it is a sorcery, if you have Ferocious online, then it matches Lightning Strike in damage to cost ratio and can continue to scale up with your mana. The general game plan is fairly simple, but there are some nuances and some things to keep in mind in specific matchups. As a general rule, you usually don't want to run out of full fist of creatures as quickly as possible. With this deck, most of your creatures are formidable threats on their own, so it pays to hold some back in case of board wipes or other removal. Against control, don't go too crazy with mulligans if you can avoid it. You have very few ways to recover from the loss of cards, and you can count on most of your threats getting removed, so you'll want as many cards as you can get. Given a choice between three drops, Savage Knuckleblade is better saved for later in the game. It's particularly good for punishing your opponent for tapping out. Also, it gets better the more mana you have available. It's food for thought. It can also pay to hold back a boon satyr, then if you should manage to get an attacker through, you can bestow the satyr onto the attacker to get extra damage in. If you're fighting Obzan, don't be afraid to trade for Siege Rhino if you can. Granted, you only have a couple creatures that can manage the feats, Serac, Air of the Wilds, Rabble Master if you get enough tokens out, but that's still more creatures than they have Rhinos. Fortunately, your colors give you solid sideboard options against control. Stubborn Denial can often be a hard counter for a measly 1 blue mana. That goes double for the blue variants that run almost entirely non-creature spells. Disdainful Stroke counters any sweeper unless you count Drown in Sorrow, plus the big blue draw spells like Jace's Ingenuity, Dig Through Time, and Dragon Lord's Prerogative. Serac Dragon Claw is a bit clunky at 5 mana with no evasion, but being uncounterable and making your other creatures uncounterable is valuable against blue. In case of Obzan, Roast gives you an extra out against Siege Rhino and Destructive Reverie kills Courser. Against more aggressive, faster decks like Mono Red, you'll want to mulligan much more aggressively. You need a fast start so you can stabilize as soon as possible. You can't expect to lose a little ground in the early game, so the sooner you can get big bodies out, the better. Aggro decks aren't exactly going to be sweeping the board, so you can go a little deeper with putting out threats. Even then, the ability of Mono Red decks to drop a ton of tokens can give you grief. Them having, say, 5 tokens on the board against 1 or 2 blockers makes for a surprising amount of inevitability from 1-1s one with no evasion. That's where the sideboard comes in. Barrage of Boulders is solid here, it gets rid of 1-1 one, one tokens and other 1 toughness creatures, and anything that survives can't block if you have a ferocious creature. Feed the Clan is also good against aggro, gaining you 5 or 10 life for 2 mana so you can stabilize from the early game. Given how many instants and sorceries show up in Mono Red now, Stubborn Denial is pretty decent as well. While we don't have much first-hand experience with the Mirror, sideboard cards we'd expect to be solid are Disdainful Stroke and Hornet Nest. Disdainful Stroke can counter half the threats in the deck, and Hornet Nest blocking just one big creature can give you enough death-touching tokens to wipe out all of them. Since this is fundamentally an aggro deck, Feed the Clan is once again a good way to take the wind out of its sails late in the game. Just keep in mind that in the mirror, your opponent will have all the same tech you do. Against the strictly red-green variation, access to Disdainful Stroke might give you a leg up, so take advantage of it. And that's the deck. What do you think? Like I mentioned before, Armstrong took this deck out for a spitted game day and nearly went undefeated, getting knocked down the top four. So close. Let me know what changes you would make to the deck, or if you like it as is. What did you play during game day? Anything cool? As always, subscribe for the latest and most reliable Magic the Gathering information you could ever need. This is the Manasaurus, I'm Wedge, thanks for watching, we'll see you next time.